The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. On 16th September this year, 22-year-old Marcel Amini died in Tehran, after being detained by Iran's notorious morality police. Her crime? Failing to wear her hijab in line with government standards. Marcel's death led to mass protests and consequent brutality from security forces. But was it the cause of public anger, or the trigger? To discuss these and related issues, join the Democracy Forum's live debate, bringing your questions and opinions for our panel of experts. The event will broadcast live on all social media platforms of the Democracy Forum, on Tuesday, November 15, 2022, 2 to 4 p.m. UK time. Hello and welcome wherever you are in the world to this Democracy Forum debate on an issue that in my view is getting far too little coverage and therefore too little debate among the confluences as crisis jostling for headline space. But it is pivotal. Iran's troubled modern history has buffeted our lives for decades. Life under the pro-Western Shah was no picnic for those who disagreed. Then came the 1979 Islamic Revolution, which has pitted Iran against the United States ever since. There was a dreadful war with Iraq. Iran and Saudi Arabia compete across the Middle East. And now, again, a steady metronome of young voices protesting the regime, its repression and its values. Our debate, will civil unrest change the face of Iran? I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your Democracy Forum host for the next two hours, and we have a superb panel of experts to unfold the complexities and give us much needed clarity of thought. Fatima Amen, Anoush Etashami, Roy Kashefi, Roxanne Farman Farmian, Maruf Kabi. Democracy Forum's chair, Barry Gardner, MP, we think will be able to extricate himself from the turmoil of British politics to be with us to sum up our debate. And first, as always, we go to the president of the Democracy Forum, Lord Charles Bruce, to give us the canvas and the background of our discussion. Lord Bruce, the screen is yours. Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Democracy Forum, which will examine the causes and consequences of civil unrest in Iran. Although this region of the Middle East has not been part of our regular webinar focus, I'm sure you'll find that the issues are strikingly familiar, just as the response of the authorities is tragically predictable. Over the last six weeks, we have seen the emergence of wide-scale protests which have not been experienced on such a scale since the Green Movement in 2009. This is a rapidly changing situation, which has been closely monitored by the Democracy Forum. And I thank the team for arranging for such an eminent group of panelists to discuss this very important and urgent topic. We're very grateful that they've agreed to participate today. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank Humphrey Hawksley again for volunteering to act as your moderator and to chair the proceedings. Iran appears to be facing its very own April Spring, Arab Spring mo mo moment where the death and custody of a young Kurdish woman, 
has unleashed a decade of pent up frustration, leading to a surge of protests and disturbances in over 80 cities. The fact that Masha Amini's arrest and death was at the hands of the morality police and that her crime was to not wear her hijab properly both underlines the remoteness of the current regime and the strength of fury that is gathering pace among Iran's younger generations, thus posing, I quote, one of the most significant threats to the Islamic Republic's 43-year dominance, writes the Financial Times correspondent from Tehran. Breaking his silence on the 3rd of October, the Supreme Leader Ayatollah, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei pointedly decided to blame the West for inciting the protests and warned that insurgents would receive, I quote, harsh persecution and punishment for their sabotage of the Islamic Republic. Since the outbreak of protests in early September, it's believed that over 10,000 people have been arrested, including 60 journalists. Iran Human Rights updated its grim tally of casualties, reporting on Sunday that over 320 people have been killed by security forces, including 43 children and 25 women. In an evident tightening of the security ratchet last week, a group of 227 lawmakers called on the government to issue the death sentence for detained protesters. Their demand was later endorsed by a newspaper published under the direction of Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, which called on the police and the Revolutionary Guard to use live ammunition against protesters. Criticizing the heavy handed response of the security forces, a group of influential economists led by a former presidential economic advisor issued a statement in early October to explain why Iranian society has, I quote, been turned into an explosive storm where recent sparks can rapidly lead to an extensive blaze. Mismanagement by the government has shifted protests from anger to hatred, they continued. This will lead to a permanent tension between the society and the government. Indeed, the current movement differs markedly from previous protests transcending social sectarian boundaries and bringing together a much broader strata of Iranian society, inevitably emboldening separatist movements, a situation exacerbated by the ethnic diversity of Arab, Kurds, Baluchis, Turks, and Sunni Muslims. Sanam Vakil, who follows developments in Iran for Chatham House, suggests that the hardline conservative government of Ibrahim Raisi is confronted by a crisis of, of legitimacy and does not have a credible economic plan. Indeed, it faces waves of external pressure, I quote, stemming from international sanctions and tensions with the United States and regional conflicts alongside its own internal economic crisis, governance and social challenges. Politics remains a complex system of competing institutions, parliamentary factions, powerful families, and military business lobbies, she writes. Well-informed commentators suggest that even if the current disorder is crushed, we shall see bigger protests in future as these demands will not disappear. The center of gravity of society's demands has shifted from politics to citizens' rights for all social classes. But interviewed recently about the durability of the protest movement, Ali Vaez, Iran Director for International Crisis Group, cautions that it suffers, I quote, from the same shortcomings as previous demonstrations, primarily lack of leadership. And asked about the Islamic Republic's continuing resolve to use draconian security measures, he said, I quote, at some stage, I think it will become impossible for them to control these movements. But as of now, the system is bound to bring down its iron fist. 
Well, welcome to the proceedings this afternoon. And if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to put them to the panel through the moderator. Lord Charles Bruce, thank you so much for that. The iron fist, which is coming down at the moment, but is it going to be impossible for the regime to ultimately control these movements? Our first speaker on this is Fatima Amen from the Middle East Institute in Washington, DC. And she has had a wide career on Iran and the wider Middle East. And she's going to ask whether the current uprisings pose the most significant challenge the Islamic Republic has ever faced. How do they differ from what's happened in the past and where might they now be heading? She is also going to explore the regime's possible approaches toward ending the turmoil. Fatima Aman, give us your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you uh, so uh, very much for having me, having me back at this uh, great event. And it's truly an honor to be here today with all of you and with the uh, distinguished speakers. Um, I will briefly, as you mentioned, will uh, explain very briefly a background of the recent remarkable events in Iran. Uh, the differences from the previous, pro, uh, you know, uh, uh, protest movements and the possible uh, government approaches in dealing with the protests. And I will uh, mention uh, why I believe that the face of Iran has already been changed. You know, as you uh, we heard in the introduction, uh, on the uh, on September 13. On an ordinary day in Tehran, an ordinary girl was stopped by the so-called morality police and detained for wearing an un you know, unsuitable uh, uh, hijab. She fell into a coma and died uh, three days later in a hospital in capital. Uh, from the videos uh, that uh, was uh, videos that were released by the security forces by the police later, to prove that she was not subject to any uh, violence. We saw actually that her hijab was less loose than uh, you know, that of other girls. So why was she detained? Uh, I was a speaker at uh, the American University of Iraq last month in Soleimania, and uh, you know, uh, a Kurdish city, obviously. And the students fiercely believed that uh, you know, it must have been Mahsa's ethnicity and uh, religious background. You know, a Kurdish Sunni from a, a, a Kurdish city in Iran. That they believed it must have been her background that uh, prompted the uh, police. You know, uh, the morality police to detain and mistreat her. So, whatever the reason, her death prompted nationwide protests, as you mentioned, led by women, I like to emphasize, and supported by, by men. So, numerous people have been killed. If the numbers are correct, uh, thousands have been detained, and some are uh, threatened with harsh punish, punishment, including death penalty. Uh, prior to this protest, the largest anti government uh, demonstration, as also mentioned, uh, were those of the uh, Green Movement in 2009, when the reformist opposition questioned the validity of the re-election of hardline President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The response of the elite Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IGC, I will just mention IRGC, and its volunteer force known as Basiji, was a brutal bloody crackdown uh, on activists. You know, activists were uh, uh, tortured to death, raped in prison, in detention, sentenced to long prison terms, uh, or just went into exile. And uh, But unlike in 2009, when the protests were focused, uh, you know, in Iran's main and large cities, uh, such as Isfahan, Tabriz, Shiraz, or Tehran, uh, this time, the recent uh, ones are, you know, smaller and happens out almost everywhere. In 2018, protests were sparked by a uh, rise in egg and poultry prices in the city of Mashhad, which is a conservative stronghold and spread to other cities and provinces 
uh, you know, uh, harmed by the uh, economy. In 2019, widespread pr protests uh, took place uh, uh, after the government's sudden decision to, to raise uh, gasoline price. Close to 1,500 people uh, are believed to have been killed by the IRGC and police forces, uh, primarily from the working and lower class. Uh, so the current protests have not been triggered by economics or factional politics, but by a widespread rejection of the entire system. And this is the, you know, distinguished from the past, uh, from the previous uh, protests and movement, protest movements. They cross, as was said by, by both of you, they cross uh, uh, geographical, ethnic and class lines. So if in the past protests uh, subsided in part because Iranians feared that their country could turn into another Libya or Syria or something even worse, this time uh, such concerns do not seem to have inhibited them. Many people uh, may have concluded that there is really no hope under the current system. Uh, in fact, these days we all hear a lot uh, we hear from Iranians saying that nothing could be worse than this system, this uh, uh, this regime. So the movement so far is leaderless, as also mentioned. Uh, young people reject the regime, but are not followers of reformists or a, a prominent dissidents in Iran or, or abroad. Um, and let me also briefly uh, mention a few... Uh, uh, approaches from the uh, security forces that I can think of. There are several ways which the regime uh, uh, might try to suppress the, the protest. They can take a, a reconciliatory tone and officially ease the restrictions on women's dress. I personally, I initially thought that some grand Ayatollahs and supreme leader himself would come out uh, taking a softer tone, criticizing the treatment of young girls over hijab, and eventually would call for abolishing the morality police. That would not have been effective immediately, but I thought, I think that would have created a rift among the activists with, you know, perhaps some uh, would call to end the protest. This possibility is fading away with the Supreme Leader's unbelievable harsh position blaming the foreign countries for the unrest and just yesterday former uh, reformist president Khatami came out and he mentioned the uh, current uh, ongoing protests if i get a chance later i may come back to that another possibility is that you know, now with thousands of young people jailed since September, uh, some majlis, as was mentioned, some majlis representatives have called for the execution of prisoners. Assume the regime uh, brutalizes the uh, prisoners and uh, kills many of them and the IRGC forces, which, by the way, so far have stayed away from direct crackdown. Com comes out and, and conduct a heavy massacre. In that case, they, they could silence the protest temporarily, but uh, definitely the resentment will be increased of the regime. And that could ultimately alienate part of their own base and lead them to join the next wave of protests. Uh, because, uh, I mean, they are loyal to the system, but they don't... I mean, part of their uh, their uh, establishment base doesn't want that, you know, this kind, this level of violence. Another possibility is that the military cracks down harshly, uh, especially in the border regions. Uh, that would, uh, in the border region, I mean, Sistan, Baluchistan, with the Kurdistan part of Iran, with uh, uh, Iranian Arabs in the Khuz in Khuzestan pro province. That could radicalize the movement and uh, it could uh, get out of control and lead to armed conflicts and, and even a civil war. So, and uh, the other possibility is that the regime uh, focuses on trying to cut people's connectivity with the outside world. 
uh, so but uh, either would uh, uh, at the same time increase the violence and mass or would uh, you know conduct a violent uh, the massacre or would avoid massacres uh, this would be a gamble for if they avoid uh, you know heavy massacres they, that would be a gamble for the regime as uh, it could lead to the opposition being encouraged and gaining more support and sympathy gradually from uh, the uh, both uh, domestically and, and internationally it could also have a dire impact on the uh, economy which is already uh, you know is in bad shape struggling uh, uh, really so, but for the movement to succeed, uh, it is essential that core supporters of the regime, those who have invested everything in the regime's existence, it is important that they split. You know, most will probably, as I mentioned, would resist changes and stay loyal to the system, but um, at least, you know, uh, they must confront the uh, establishment and join the masses. For, for that to happen, they should be included in the protests. I mean, opposition inclusiveness is essential and that is not there yet. Uh, how much time do I live? You could, if you could wrap up and we will come back to you um, in with, because there's a couple of questions I do have to put to you. Sure. If I get a chance, I will also talk about how people could be helped, perhaps, and how Iran's ethnicities are coming closer to each other through the recent protest. I would just end it here. At, oh, now. OK. I, I mean, I just wanted to, to, to thank you very much because that was so interesting. I've got a list of things. And if anybody wants to ask any questions to any specific panelists or to or to the panel as a whole, put them in the comments and they will be passed on. Uh, we have uh, two or three or already I, but so, so talking to the uh, to the topic of the debate will civil unrest change the face of iran has it already changed the face of iran is it unstoppable this rejection i truly believe it has already been changed and it is irreversible you know okay. uh, there are uh, let me just mention something that it, that has never happened in the past you know uh, first of all uh, 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 Iranians are getting to know each other uh, from all ethnic, ethnic backgrounds and uh, religious backgrounds. You know, if in the past people or protests from the Sistan, Baluchistan part of Iran or from the mm -hmm. Kurdistan part of Iran or from, you know, Iranian Arabs, they were viewed in the eyes of many Iranians as just separatists or just bandits, you know. But right now, First of all, maybe because Mahsa Amini was court, and the other, uh, you know, distinguished phenomenon is that the uh, Mulavi Abdul Hamid, he is a re Sunni religious leader of Baluchistan, Sistan Baluchistan, and Friday prayer of Zahedan. He has gained so much popularity, uh, you know, and people sympathize unbelievably with the victims of the uh, massacre that was with the victims of massacre that was uh, conducted just recently, uh, days after the events of Tehran protest, uh, after the protest broke out. And they really, I think, people are coming together. This so, has so this never. So this is very interesting because actually we last month we were discussing the Sri Lanka uprisings there and that was people of all classes and ethnicities coming together because of the illegitimacy of the regime. Uh, this is, I think, what you're saying here. But just very quickly, how does this coming together and uprising and legitimacy, uh, the system not delivering for them, compare to what happened in 1979? when there was that similar coming together and the overthrowing of the Shah? So in 1979, there was a, first of all, the uh, religious leaders, they had, they were armed with, uh, you know, the mean and tools to mobilize people. They had access to all mosques and religious institutions. 
and uh, something that was also more tolerated during the Shahs, I mean, before the revolution. So they had, there was a charismatic leader of Ayatollah uh, Khomeini who turned to be a really a violent, and, and I don't want to get there, but uh, millions of people were, came out and supported him and supported that movement. Uh, which uh, many of them regret what uh, what uh, they did, obviously. But uh, you know, it's not like it is right now. It this right now they are just you know young people. They yeah. you know or women just uh, teenage girls who come out and just uh, ask for their own. You know, initially they ask for their own freedom and private space but now the demand is beyond that it's really yes. they just reject the entire system it, 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 it's burst out in a way that that any uh, sort of authoritarian regime does not want to happen fatima Amin, thank you very much please stay around because the questions are coming in uh, we are now going to anush Eshami, a professor of international relations at durham university and he's been a fellow of the World Economic Forum, served on the Global Agenda Council, so has a wide perspective and is the editor of major book series on the Middle East and the wider Muslim world. One of its latest on Iran is called Iran Stuck in Transition, a great title, stuck there. Uh, he is now going to delve into the Islamic Republic's crisis of legitimacy that we've been discussing. Professor Etashami, the screen is yours. Uh, what a pleasure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can I thank you? Can I thank Lord Bruce and also the forum whose work I've admired for many years to invite me and also to bring me along such a distinguished colleague. I suspect I'll be letting everybody down given how high level the discussion has been thus far. Uh, my task is to look at issue of cross legitimacy. Let me beginning, begin by saying that for revolutionary regimes, legitimacy is a hard currency that they expect and at least they think that they can trade with indefinitely. What we've seen in the cases of the Soviet Union, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Algeria, that inflexibility and dogma can challenge the very value of the hard currency that they expect to survive forever. Iran, in my view, is no exception uh, to that. And in Iran's case, alas, I think the hard currency of legitimacy has begun to turn into dust. And it turned thus from the late 1990s when the RGC, Revolutionary Guards, about which we've already heard so much, issued an ultimatum to one of Iran's most popular presidents, indeed its most popular president, Khatami, uh, the sitting president, to change his ways, change his course, or face consequences from it. That was a shock to Iranians who had assumed that the system was pliable, flexible, and indeed reformable. The, the, the devaluation of legitimacy currency accelerated in 2009, of which we've already heard from Lord Bruce and my colleague, also Fatma, in 2009, when Iranian voters uh, poured onto the streets for the first time in millions since the revolution of 1979, um, challenging Ahmadinejad's re-election as president with the slogan, where is my vote? So the erosion of, of the Islamic Republic's narrative of dominance and legitimacy, therefore, has been in the making for some time. But to put the current round in more context, I guess a broader context, I'd like to do it along three axes. First, to look at the socioeconomic crisis that Iran is facing. Second, the political crisis that has emerged. And thirdly, the international dimension of those. And to argue that, in fact, all three are now converging to create a major crisis for the Islamic Republic. The socioeconomic crisis, of which again we hear much, um, is of profound import importance in affecting people's general well being and their, their perceptions. Let me put some figures behind what I'm saying here. Inflation is running at between anything between 60 and 80 percent. Here we are in the United Kingdom worrying about a 10, 12, 14 percent inflation and its consequences for us. And imagine for a country of 25 million to have to try and manage with an inflation rate of 80%. There is a huge uh, scarcity of very basic resources and goods and services that a country of that size and wealth indeed expects. 
population of 80 million, 85 million, of which 60 million are on the age of 30, are still net consumers uh, in effect. And yet purchasing power has dropped by over 40% um, since 19, since 2015, and inequality has intensified dramatically. So much so that 10% of the population today control a half of Iran's national wealth. And 20% of the lowest income groups hold only 0.5% of the country's wealth. These are dramatic contrasts between the haves and the have-nots. And for a revolutionary regime that claims to have equality at its bedrock, these are indeed uh, very scary numbers. So a third of the population now live below the poverty line. And of the youth that I've mentioned already, 25% are unemployed. The middle class has been so squeezed that it now constitutes only 35% of the population of 85 million. Why? Because Iran's mainstay uh, uh, income, oil exports, has dropped dramatically to about $39 billion a year on the basis of about half a million barrel of oil exported. This is partly because of the sanctions reimposed on the country by Trump, but it's also been amplified by the war in Ukraine and Russia's efforts to discount its oil exports at the expense of its ally, Iran, to ensure that it has its own uh, oil income well, well preserved. Uh, to add further salt to injury of the Iranian population, the national currency has collapsed, uh, exacerbating inflation, but also making any transaction on a private basis almost impossible. So we have, on the one hand, chronic capitalism, which, again, the sanctions have enhanced, where state-linked groups and organizations, including uh, the RGC and so on, um, are controlling the what we call the heights of the national economy. They control trade, they control smuggling, and virtually everything that comes in and out of the country. So chronic capitalism combined with sanctions are in a sense squeezing the life out of Iranian society. And that is in a sense, the, the basis of the social economic crisis that the country is facing. Add to it, of course, mismanagement, incompetence, corruption, and so on. And then you get a much bigger picture. The second leg, Mr. Chairman, is the political crisis that has gripped the country. For Iranians, they're now facing an unresponsive, unrepresentative, unaccountable, self-serving regime. And all of this came to a head for them when in 2021, against the wishes of most members of the elite, and also clearly from public opinion, a president that was uh, close to the leader, uh, Atullah Khamenei, was foisted on the population through an election which had the lowest turnout in the Republic's history of only 48.8%. Uh, president Raisi, uh, was installed alongside a parliament which is majority conservative. In a sense, for for uh, the majority of the population, uh, leadership was not just out of touch, but it was reinforcing what I call the Grayman syndrome of keeping power tightly in the hands of Iran's aging elite. Uh, it fed to nepotism, absence of opportunity, and also, in a sense, a hardening of the regime's core to exclude reformists who often acted as a mediating force in Iran's fractious politics. A securitized elite that, that was reinforced by Ahmadinejad's election in 2005 has led, if you like, to the strangulation of how the population feels of opportunity. And that's been reinforced by elite networks of control uh, right across society. And in many ways, Iran's isolation has also fed social insecurity. And I would say that the last straw that brought the camels back was what my, my colleague Fatima has mentioned is loss of hope. And that was the, the, the flame going out of the JCPOA, the nuclear deal that the regime itself had presented as the way out of Iran's predicament. And this year, the ending of that in many ways seems to have distinguished the prospects for change for Iranians. And then, of course, comes the issue of hijab. And this is important, and I'm sure my colleagues will focus on this later. It's important because the hijab symbolizes, in many ways, the very identity of this regime. And when Iran's brave woman challenged the regime 
to have to wear the hijab. They are, in a sense, directly challenging the very legitimacy of the regime and the foundations of power in the Islamic Republic. Let me very quickly run on to, to talk about the international aspects of the crisis that Iran is facing. First, as I've already mentioned, there is the eroding impact of sanctions. These are deep, uh, continuing to deepen, and are biting hard at Iran's uh, society. The elite continue to live well, their children continue to live well in the West, uh, have a good life, but the majority of people are pressured um, into, into trying to make ends meet. In the absence of the JCPOA uh, 2.0, obviously indefinitely postponed now, the impasse seems to become even more palpable for the populations. So the prospects of growing pressure and isolation from the West have also uh, been compounded. But if you put it in a, in a broader context, Iran's exposure in the, in the region has also is, is emerging as a challenge. For a long while, Iran was seen as this um, never doing wrong, ever powerful regional actor. In Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, Iran was seen to be pulling all the strings. I would like to argue, in fact, that Iran is vulnerable in every one of these spaces. In Iraq, its authority and its, its ideology of Islamic Republic, Valati Fari, is directly challenged. In Lebanon, the chaos there is now pointing the finger at Iran and its ally, Hezbollah. In Syria, without Russian forces, Iran has very little control. And once Russia has to pull out because of the Ukrainian war, Iran will have to carry the can. In Yemen, likewise, the Houthis do not speak for all Yemenis. And Iran, having put all of its eggs in that one basket, limits its ability to shape the Yemeni politics in its own favor. Afghanistan, the Taliban are no friend of Iran. And in Azerbaijan, Armenia, in the north, in the Caucasus, Iran is a silent actor when Turkey, Russia, and European Union and America intervene to try and stabilize that region. In a sense, the worst case for Iran is that the Arab League has now put Iran alongside Israel as an occupier of Arab lands. If that is not a measure of legitimacy, I cannot say what is. But finally, let me note that the Ukraine war is, is going to wreak havoc uh, on Iran as well. The EU already has abandoned its mediating role between US and Iran in, in JCPOA, partly because of Iran's involvement in the Ukraine war. Uh, Iran, I think, could be punished by the UN for violating Resolution 2231 on the JCPOA, which bars Iran from trading, importing or exporting missile related technologies. We know Iran has been doing so uh, to Russia to use in Ukraine, but also Ukraine itself will be in a position to demand more reparations from Iran as an aggressor in damaging life and property in Ukraine. So it, the, the Republic's predicament in many ways is, is crisis, crisis, crisis. And the, in the absence of ability to respond in any constructive and positive way to the crisis that it's facing, I do not see a rapid end to the current protests. They may die down, but these fires will smolder underneath and it takes another spark to bring it up. The question we need to ask is how much reserves, how much residual power does the Republic have to continue to maintain control? And we'll have that answer, I think, once the crisis forces revisions within the elite itself. And that has happened in the past elsewhere. It has been in Iran itself in 79, and it's likely to happen again. Let me stop there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anush Etashami, for, for that. Uh, you paint a picture there of these old men in their ivory towers without much imagination, faced with something they don't understand, plus the buffeting from all sides. You gave us the many faces of Iran that have been changing or due for change the civil unrest. What can the West do? Because the last thing anybody wants, I suspect, is a collapse of the regime, because that would be disastrous. Correct me if you think I'm wrong. But it doesn't seem that there's much imagination coming out of the West, apart from sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. They're bad people, bad people, bad people. Give us a, give us a, a roadmap as to what we in London or Washington or Brussels or anywhere should do about this. 
I, I think, uh, Chairman, that is a really, really tough question. It's interesting that former President Obama has only recently begun to reflect on his policies over, over 2009 and, and think about whether he was right um, in, in, in what he did or not in terms of being hands off because advisors uh, to governments uh, have many competing uh, views to put forward. And in, in this case, I, I think the West is now finding itself between the rock and the hard place in that if it gives in uh, to try and to find a moderate way through to restoration of JCPOA, it'll be seen as appeasing the regime and the regime will capitalize on the resources that will be released to repress the people. There is no question about it. We've seen in the past the money that comes in lines the pockets of the elite and not society. So I don't think the people on the streets would necessarily want to see the regime re-empowered. And yet they recognize that without the lifting of sanctions, this, this, the grind of poverty will worsen. So in the immediate sense, I suspect the population would like to see the sanctions lifted, but they would like to see lifted in a way that puts controls on what Iran can and cannot do with the resources released. And again, there are precedents for that kind of thing uh, from elsewhere. That would be one response. The other would be for the West to finally take sides, uh, albeit morally, and support the protesters and try and put Iranian regime to account in fora that Iranian uh, government representatives are present whether it's a Human Rights Commission, whether it's Security, uh, United Nations General Assembly, but also many other fora. Uh, the Parliamentary Forum, for example, that Iranian parliamentarians are member of, these are all uh, platforms that Iran's narrative and elite can be challenged on what they do. We've seen snippets of this, and I think more of this uh, will be useful. Uh, could, could I put you coming off, off the back of that a question from one of our audience, uh, MD Ishmael, who says, might the UN form a commission in its Human Rights Council to deal with government crimes in Iran, as urged by the country's exiled Prince Reza Pavlavi? How effective might this be? I think these, these measures will have a symbolic effect at this stage. At one level, I have to say that it will reinforce the siege mentality that has now taken hold in Tehran. Ayatollah Khamenei, um, um, his whole political life has been built around security, if you like. And anything that he hears from the outside is immediately interpreted as a conspiracy. And if that is the case, then they will resist whatever is thrown at them. But that doesn't mean that the world should not take a stand and begin to hold these guys to account for the crimes that they are committing. Yeah, it sounds like a huge conundrum there with um, thinking out of the box needed both with the uh, with the Iran elite in their ivory towers and also in, in the West on how to break a siege mentality without destroying all the institutions and having the sort of mayhem that came about in Syria, Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Please stay with us because, uh, because this is a, we, I think from you, we are finding out that the many faces of Iran have begun to change and that change is going to be inevitable. Uh, our next speaker is Roya Keshefi, head of the Human Rights Committee of the Association de Cheshire Iranian, ACI, uh, who is going to be talking about the role of today's women's movement in the context of what is happening in Iran. It is a fight that she says over much more than wearing or not wearing a piece of cloth. Roya Keshefi, lay out your argument for us. Thank you very much for having me, for inviting me. And thank you to my two colleagues who've painted such a wonderful picture of um, what life is like in Iran um, at the moment. So in that context, I'm going to um, give like a historical look of how we've got here. And um, I hope that in uh, the question and answers that will follow with my colleagues, I will be able to discuss the sanctions and what is going on in Iran um, further. Um, so, in my opinion, to answer the question of this discussion, will civil unrest or revolution, as President Macron called it yesterday, change the face of Iran? We need to know and understand how um, we've got here. Um, within two weeks of the revolution in February 79, women took to the streets on 8th of March 
to protest against the impending Islamic rule, they understood the hijab, which was going to be forced on them as a tool of control. Within it, it carries the whole Islamic viewpoint on chastity, religious morality, sexual desires, family, and the concept of honor and shame. Article four of the constitution insists on the adherence of all laws to Islamic criteria. The interpretation of this Islamic criteria is on the shoulders of the 12 members of the Guardian Council that are directly and indirectly appointed by the absolute supreme leader. And so consequently, as a result of the laws, uh, um, women and religious minorities are legally discriminated against in Iran. Since 79, the segregation of the sexes in Iran is physical as well as symbolic. The physical segregation is managed by having separate entrances for men and women to public buildings, uh, with guards observing the um, Islamic cover-up, separate entrances for um, buses or trams or um, metro, um, periodically segregating seating arrangements in public spaces. What we've seen um, in self-service at universities, um, boys and uh, the young men and women are segregated where they eat together. And in these demonstrations, we've seen them actually lay down a cloth on the floor outside and sitting together to eat as a sign of protest. So very simple things. Um, the closure of um, single sex, of, of uh, mixed schools that we had before the revolution, setting up single sex schools with same sex teachers, segregating universities to the detriment of female students and so on. For its part, um, symbolic segregation is reflected in the dress code, which shields the physical attributes of its wearer from the eyes of the unrelated males with whom social intercourse should be limited or prohibited. Sexuality and sexual desire play a major role in drafting legislation. Islamic Islam recognizes both female and male sexual urges and therefore insists on marriage at a young age, um, girls as young as 13 or even nine um, in some cases, and for men in polygamy as protected in family protection law um, reflect this. Therefore, because Islamic hijab is not just a dress code, but a whole culture, the ruling clergy have established legal codes and numerous institutions, agencies and organizations to enforce it and ensure its observance. Legislation, customs, traditions affected or inspired by interpretations of the Quran by the Guardian Council and the Sharia combine to define concepts of female roles and status within the society. In Iran, laws sanction the traditional patriarchal culture and consequently women do not benefit from equal rights in law or in practice. In April 2005, in the last months of the Khatami presidency, the High Council of Cultural Revolution, under his leadership, ratified a directive entitled The Means and Ways of Propagating the Culture of Chastity and Hijab. Following the presidential elections of May 2005, it became Ahmadinejad's duty as the new head of the High Council of Cultural Revolution to ensure its implementation. On 3rd of January 2006, the Executive Procedural Code for the Propagation of Culture of Chastity and Hijab was ratified and passed on to 27 administrative departments within governmental ministries, agencies and forces. This included um, state radio and television, health ministry, um, trade ministry, um, and so forth. This law, this procedural code, demonstrates the true nature of the Islamic regime and its attitude towards women and how it proposes to change um, the present culture, the existing culture, through stealth policies. The consequences of this law impacted directly on the lives of women in Iran on all levels, from their access to healthcare, education, employment, um, welfare support and so forth, to their status within the society. In the years that followed on the lighter side, as directed by this law, they, we have witnessed Islamic fashion shows being organized by the Basij and disciplinary forces. 
As a result of these laws, thousands of women, if not millions, have been detained throughout Iran since 2006 and have now got criminal files. Policies on university segregation have been enforced. Women are prohibited from studying certain courses or attending universities in locations other than the paternal or marital hometowns. The present day morality police, who we constantly hear about, Gashd Ershad, is a direct consequence of the Khatami Directive and on its ensuing laws. But while the regime has been busy trying to find ways and methods of controlling the presence of women within society, Iranian women have not stayed silent. They have fought hard for their place within Iranian society. And despite restrictions, we have a young, vibrant, educated class of women who know where they want to be and are fighting to achieve equity and equality for all women, for all Iranians, wherever they live in Iran. The level of violence practiced in arresting and um, in arresting the offending women because of their hijab throughout Iran meant that tragically the death of someone at the hands of morality police was inevitable. As a human rights defender and a human rights documenter, we have witnessed many, many violent arrests um, in the last few years. What happened to Gina or Massa Amini could have happened to any one of the women beaten and dragged into the police vans because of their non-observance or poor observance of Islamic hijab. Um, to use the same terminology as Anusha Tishami, it really was the straw that broke the camel's back. The sense of injustice inspired all those who have felt marginalized and discriminated against in Iran. Um, Massa's, Gina's ethnicity, religion, it brought everyone together. When it first started, like many others, I feared the worst. I thought that many would be killed and the regime would manage to control the protest as it has done on so many occasions and as it did three years ago. Um, today, tomorrow and day after is a three-day anniversary of what happened in November 2019 and where 1,500 people were um, killed um, while internet was cut off. And that is being marked on the streets in Iran and protests are organized for outside Iran as well. However, astonishingly, we're witnessing the bravery and the courage of this young generation, men and women together, who are simply fighting for a normal life what, what do they want? What do they want? They want to go to school without being brainwashed, to attend university, to find a job without gender or religious bias or restrictions, to, found, to find housing without any kind of religious or gender restriction or bias, to get married without having to enter into long convoluted marital contracts that would secure women's future. So it's not just a piece of cloth that there are protesting for in, on the streets in Iran. It's a normal life. Simply, they want to have a normal life. Equality, equity, woman, life, freedom. What's happening on the streets in Iran today, in my opinion, is the beginning of the end. They may be silenced, but something has changed. This wall of fear has gone and they've made themselves heard by the ruling elite in Iran and the international community. I dread to think what will happen when the international gaze is shifted away from Iran. And I think the, it's really important to keep this dialogue alive. So yes, in my opinion, what's happening in Iran will shape its future for the better. A heavy price has been paid to date. We saw the first death sentence issued yesterday. Many others are on death lists waiting to be tried. And as Lord Bruce said at the beginning, 227 members of the Islamic Consultative Assembly have asked the judiciary to issue a death sentence for the protesters. Over 14,000 people are held in detention throughout Iran. I'm going to stop here. 
And I hope that in the question and answers, we'll be able to um, address so much that's been said. And I have a lot to comment on on the question of sanctions uh, and what we could do in the future. So I'm open to your questions and I look forward to the following conversation to come. Th thank you, Roy. And I have some questions right now for you that I want answers for to sort of ground us as we move on. And I know this might seem an obvious question, but why, what is the makeup of Iranian society that produces this repressive culture? Why are these people being so repressive? The Iranian population is not repressive. The regime is repressive. The majority Why? of the population is young. The, if you look at the makeup of the population, Iran had 37 million people in 1979. It's near 90 million now. So we have this majority young population that is tech savvy, is in touch with the rest of the world. It knows what it's missing because it's being brainwashed, engineered into this um, ideologically led um, system that violates its rights. It's very simple, simple freedom of how to dress to come out. So that so, is a symbol of all the laws that are discriminating them, that is breaking down the equality that they want. So, so, so amongst the young people that have come up, is there a group within the elite that can create a revision uh, amongst the more powerful institutions so that there won't be the sort of bloodshed that we were talking about earlier? The young people within the elite are benefiting from the present system. I, it, it wouldn't be to their advantage for things to change. Um, Anusha Tashami talked about nepotism and the kind of um, corruption that's going on in the system. And they are pocketing from the existing system. They are pocketing. They don't understand the stakes that are involved they are, for their nation. They will hang on for as long as they possibly can to line their pockets as much as they can. Um, I remember many years ago, um, I was having a conversation with... Um, an official who was in charge of my security on at some stage. And I said, oh, I look forward to the day where um, I have to hang up my human rights hat and um, not have to fight for that. And he said, oh, don't worry, that role will always be there because when the regime changes, you will have to fight for their right because they will be seeking asylum outside Iran. So uh, it, it's yeah. this, do, I, do you know what I mean? So it's, yes. they are trying to make as much as they can now so they won't be destitute when they have to when, come. When, and when the they'll they'll be able to go to Paris and London and Washington and wherever. But they're and, in their and... pockets. Yes, okay, they wouldn't have sounds... to pay asylum. So, so... you're 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 conundrum. You're making giving us a bigger conundrum and depressing me even more. But I'd want to give you a, a question from Prashant Kumar, who's in our audience. That with women at the forefront of demands for reform in Iran. Uh, could this see women as a real force for change in the wider Islamic world? I think Iran has always been at the forefront of change in the region. Um, what's happening in Iran today hasn't just happened overnight. Women in Iran have been fighting for over 100 years for their equal rights and their just place within the society, equal just place within the society. Um, what happened um, with the Green Movement in 2009 spearheaded, in a sense, the Arab Spring. So what happened on the streets in Iran gave a momentum that change is possible. And what is happening on the streets of Iran, asking for freedoms and for equality, um, it's not standing up against religion. It's not a rebellion against religion in Iran. Laws are so intertwined, Islamic law with civic law, it's so intertwined that what they're um, opposing are the laws, but the laws are Islamic. So it's not necessarily an anti-Islamic movement, it's an mm. anti-oppression movement, but the yeah. laws are, are taken, um, their foundation is this interpretation of Islam according to the ruling elite in Iran, which is a very narrow um, again, portion of the Muslims in the world because there, mm. it's a Shia belief and it's a small minority within the Shia um, majority mm. in the world. 
So it's a very narrow interpretation. But in my opinion, if change happens in Iran and we have freedom, um, it could indeed impact the wider community in, in the region. Yes. Right. Well, let's let's keep keep that thought. A lot of the panelists want to talk more about sanctions, so we're going to make sure that we go round at the end to get a get a view on that. We are next going to to Roxanne Farman Farmayan, uh, who teaches international relations on the Middle East and North Africa at the University of Cambridge, and is also a senior visiting research fellow at King's College London. She is an expert in media in the region, and we do have an audience question on that. And one of her recent works is Iran's rhetoric aggression, instrumentalizing foreign policy through the media. She is going to expand on our discussion to tell us how civil unrest is impacting those relationships in Iran's, within Iran and within the region of the wider world, America, Russia, China, and Europe. Roxanne Farman Farmian, tell us what you know. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with this fantastic group and um, and likewise to have an opportunity to discuss this subject, which is keeping all of us that focus on Iran uh, very, very uh, busy at the moment. And indeed, I would like to uh, look primarily at the relationships that Iran is um, engaging with abroad as a result of the uprising, how those are being affected. And I would say that um, there are a couple of large elements that we need to consider. One is that we all know that Iran has been under sanctions for many years, decades. And we also know that politically it has been a rogue state. But the isolation, the enormous insulation that it is uh, enveloped in is in fact suddenly coming into sharp focus right now because as you ask for example what can the west do uh, one of the questions that goes along with that is is there really a role for outside powers in a situation such as an internal turmoil such as taking place at the moment inside iran do the people want that but thirdly, is it even possible? And in a case that we are seeing with Iran at the moment, that insulation, that isolation is definitely playing a role. And that's something that's on the minds of its neighbors, particularly in the region. The other big area that I think we are um, now facing as to what happens when possible leadership is at stake in Iran is the fact that everyone knows that its uh, supreme leader is an elderly man 82 years old, he's not in good shape. So prior to the uprisings, one of the things many of us were looking at was uh, the analysis of succession. Who will be uh, the next leader? What will he uh, be counting? And I say he, because it's very unlikely it will, it will be a woman. Um, what kinds of groups within Iran will uh, be the sources of his power and who will play what roles? This is now something that uh, Iran's neighbors and I think the large players outside of uh, in, the, in, the, in the global arena now find they're considering extremely carefully because it's very possible that there will be a change perhaps uh, at the top. And if not, that this might coincide with a sudden faltering of the leadership and uh, that the internal um, protests could actually result in some kind of uh, battle taking place at the top that is so severe that it could trigger a change more quickly at the top than we might have anticipated. So those are the two larger pictures that I'm, I'm, I'm the sort of lenses I would like to put the, the following into. And then I will look um, now at three areas, Iran's more immediate neighbors, the Gulf and the, the Middle East in which it finds itself. Um, then the Iran and the West, so primarily the US and Europe. And finally, its relationships with the two other rising powers on our uh, global stage, Russia and China. And very interestingly, I see that the relationship of the, um, of the uprisings 
with each of those groups is actually can be decanted through uh, a different type of lens. So I would say that those uh, the relationship with the the neighbors, uh, the Gulf, Iraq, Turkey, and to the east, Afghanistan, for example, Pakistan, can very much be understood in terms of security. First of all, um, Iran has now twice attacked the northern Kurdish region. Um, possibly, it is being said that uh, by certain observers, such as uh, Abdul Rasoon um, Div Salar, who, who works at the Arab Gulf States Institute uh, in DC, he sees this as something that is a, um, a diversionary tactic, that it is uh, an area that is next door to where Masa Amini was from. Uh, the regime has always emphasized separatism. And uh, so this is an opportunity for it to divert attention, attack a neighbor, not expect much retaliation, and uh, therefore by uh, deflect the um, the attention that's going on inside. Um, likewise, Saudi and uh, a number of its allies um, have sent out an SOS to the U.S. and to 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 its neighbors, saying that it has intelligence indicating that the Iranians may be planning a significant security threat in the region. And again, this is something that shows a weakness at the top of the regime, uh, perhaps, and certainly concern and fear on the part of the neighbors as to what great uh, upheaval inside Iran might constitute. And it's certainly been um, mooted that some of its neighbors Saudi, Israel might find that um, a period of great upheaval inside Iran would be beneficial, that it would be better than having a, a, an organized, uh, directed government in Iran, because it would make it easier for agendas that perhaps others in the region have to be put forward. And it would be unlikely that some of the threat that comes from a centralized organization, a centralized government could actually um, then be prosecuted. But of course that is not proven. And I think generally it's felt that upheaval um, bodes ill for neighbors uh, and the bleeding effects across borders that any kind of um, upset inside a country can imply for its region. So I'm not necessarily a, a proponent of that argument. But in any case, we see that in Saudi Arabia and in the region, there is a concern as to what this will mean. And very interestingly, in um, Iraq, we see a new leadership, a new president having just taken over. And one of the first elements that we heard coming out of the new president's office was that both Saudi and Iran had approached him in order to resuscitate the talks that the two states had uh, engaged in prior to there being um, a turnover of power inside Baghdad, because Baghdad has been the one that has been facilitating these talks. And the talks are very much focused on uh, the Yemen war, but trying to find common ground. Uh, and certainly one of the elements is also that there has not been formal diplomatic um, exchange between Saudi Arabia and Iran now for several years. There's no uh, ambassador in either of the states from the other. So I think there's there was a, a an element of that in the talks. They were put on hold, as I said. Now, according to the new president of Iraq, they are to be resuscitated. So that may bode uh, well in terms of the uh, region taking on Iran to try to still solve some of its ongoing problems. Just a note about two other areas um, that have been mentioned by our speakers. Um, one of them, Lebanon, is also rather interesting uh, to see what the arrangement there is. And indeed, that is the home of Hezbollah, which is uh, Iran's strongest militia um, uh, ally. 
very recently, there has been a maritime agreement, uh, uh, border agreement that was finalized between Lebanon and Israel. And this is something that for years has not been able to be finalized because there has been so much pushback by Hezbollah and by Iran. But that agreement actually implies a certain weakness on the part of Iran, although it was definitely to have been consulted before the agreement came forth. It is very likely that Iran does not have the clout or possibly even the funds to support Hezbollah to the degree that it has been before, and that uh, it then had to give its stamp of approval to an agreement that up until now about that border, it has not wanted uh, to to uh, accept. And finally, we have Syria. And I think one of the complications of this entire um, interesting set of power plays that we're seeing inside Iran is that one of the reasons the uh, Revolutionary Guard has uh, shown itself unwilling to, to join the uh, certainly join the um, the demonstrations, but also in, in, in any way show any weakness, is that it has absolutely everything to lose for um, the demonstrations to take over and to cause major upset in Iran and uh, nothing to gain. And one of the issues that it, it's facing is that it would be very difficult for its leadership to actually find countries to go to should it lose its purchase inside Tehran. And Syria is one of the very few to which uh, the leadership of the Revolutionary Guard would actually be able to take a plane and uh, go and find refuge. Various of its leaders have bought properties inside Aleppo, for example, and so that would be probably one of the very few options it would it would have. And a country that's in the midst of its own civil war is simply not terribly attractive uh, to those that are looking for refuge. So we see that being generally a, a the situation of its neighbors. I do want to say one word about um, one final word about that part of the region, and that is yes, the 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 movement of women inside Iran and what they are asking for is being looked at with great concern uh, by the Islamic neighbors outside. Um, in in Iraq, it's very much being looked at as a culture war, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more as we talk about the West. But um, Muqtada al-Sadr, who is a major leader in um, Iraq, has already issued a statement saying he does not want um, the women of, of Iraq to get that the idea of taking off their uh, hijabs, although they're showing somewhat more flexibility in Baghdad than they certainly are inside Iran, because there have been reports that some schools, particularly for younger girls inside Baghdad, are um, are considering rethinking the hijab rule. But Muqtad al-Sadr has also pointed out something else, which I think is very interesting. And in addition to the women taking off their hijab in Iran, uh, the newest images we're getting is something that's called turban tossing, which is that the turbans of the clerics are being um, flipped off their heads. And uh, this is a statement about secular, about political Islam, about how this new set of protests is really uh, finding purchase inside Iran. And Muqtad al-Sadr again has stated he does not want to see anything like that inside Iraq. So there is pushback, there is concern as to what is the modeling that's going on inside Iran that might be taken up by populations inside the Islamic world. Now, to move on quickly, we've got two other areas, and one of them is Iran in the West. So um, up until now, one of the greatest areas of exchange, where people actually were sitting down with each other from both Iran and the West, of course, were the negotiations of the nuclear deal, the JCPOA. And that has been on hold for the last several months, certainly before the uprisings or the protests began. But now, interestingly, there's really been a narrative inside the West about what's going on in Iran that has focused on human rights in a way that we haven't seen and very much in terms of culture. And so we're seeing that the United States and Europe are both approaching uh, the um, uprisings, bringing 
um, an effort, for example, to the UN to remove Iran from the um, Commission on the Protection of Women. There are um, certainly more sanctions, but there's also an effort to provide on the part of the US you know, in, um, a reduction in sanctions to enable the internet to have greater access for the population. And of course, Elon Musk providing Starlink uh, as one of the options to get online. And I think that what we're seeing is that the Europeans and the Americans are feeling very uncomfortable about the possibility of sitting down with anybody in Iran at this at, at, at this point and signing the JCPOA because they don't want to be seen um, actually sitting down and negotiating with a, a regime that is doing this to its people. So we're seeing an extremely uh, uncomfortable situation there. Um, I'll wrap up and, and say that um, the relationship with Iran and Russia is one that is increasingly strong. Uh, we've seen an uptick in, in visitations uh, between them, and uh, we are also seeing that there is a great deal more trade that is being uh, encouraged by all sides uh, of the Russia-Iran uh, relationship. So in those terms, I would say that we are seeing uh, that becoming uh, considerably more of a technological um, exchange, and the same is true with China. And China is going to be playing a key role, particularly at how well these demonstrations succeed, because it is the one that Iran is turning turning to for AI and face recognition software, and uh, because it's turning out that it's quite hard for Iranian authorities, police, to be in the streets and have to shoot at young people and women. And so what they want is that they're able to surveil more effectively. And China is very willing to provide uh, that kind of material. And apparently there are uh, thousands of new cameras being set up in 28, new ci in 28 cities throughout the country. And that is all due to uh, Chinese help. So I think I'll stop there. But as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a multifaceted set of relationships. <laughs> All I can see changing as these demonstrations uh, come into focus. Yeah, we, we Iran has many faces that we're we're discussing the change on them. I just want to you mentioned one thing when you talk about the changes face of the regime. Could you very briefly and in a nutshell take us through how the regime has moved one way or the other since 1979? Because it, there was a time 10 years ago or so when it was more open and then it closes and then it opens and it closes. Do you have that trajectory at your fingertips? Well, I would say as a, as a general trajectory that it's become increasingly rigid. And part of that has some a lot to do with the age of those that are at the top. Um, and I think the other element is that uh, at the beginning of the revolution, it was it was a situation that was, in my mind, hijacked very early on. There was the hostage crisis, and then there was an Iran-Iraq war. And the result was that it became militarized and the whole um, language had to become considerably more focused on loyalty and patriotism and those that were supporting uh, the country as holy warriors. And so when it came out of that um, is, is where the first beginnings of politics began. And uh, we see quite a bit of, of range in politics during the ensuing um, eight to 10 years, actually, uh, maybe even 15. But it was uh, not a consistent picture because it was still, for the first time, actually experimenting with what political groups and different kinds of policies actually meant. And but, but so we had. Sorry, just a, Iran, I know they're not free, fair, or anything, but Iran does actually have elections that sways a needle a little bit, doesn't it? Well, it did. It certainly did. And so yeah. what I was going to say is that actually got all thrown out with the current uh, election of Raisi, right. which was really a sham election, very much designed to to prepare him, actually, to 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 help him become a more legitimate uh, successor to the supreme leader and take on that role. And I think that I would certainly say these uh, these protests have thrown a uh, a fly into that ointment. He's showing himself totally incompetent to take care of what's going on in the streets. And and just very quickly, with your media hat on, um, from Shamin Alam, with social media a core part of today's protests in Iran and the people united in their anger, uh, 
do you agree that unlike in earlier times, change is now inevitable? Well, we've had this question of change come up quite a bit. And obviously, yeah. change has been constant. I mean, I think we've, as we've heard, there have been different kinds of demonstrations. There's been social media that was very much part of the 2009 um, yep. um, uprisings. They were thought of as the, the first Twitter uh, uprisings. Um, I would say that what's happening in Iran, however, is quite typical of what's happening elsewhere. Social media is as much a fracturing as it is a uniting factor. And so we're seeing many different kinds of influencers on the media, certainly the young people and the young women, they are singing from the same hymn book, but there's many, many different voices that are on the social media. And a lot of people, I would say the surveys are showing that only about 20% of the population actually are supporting the message that's going out that they want to overthrow the Islamic Republic. The reformists, for example, don't quite fit that. And there's a whole, or, you know, whole vocabulary exchange going on by the reformists as well as the hardliners. That, that's that's fascinating. Thank you, Roxanne Farman Farman. Uh, stay with us because we are going to talk about sanctions in the West when we go around the panel at the end. It seems the, the, the predominant question here. Our final speaker is Maruf Kabi, visiting fellow at the London School of Economics uh, and uh, Middle East Center. And his most recent book is entitled The Formation of Modern Kurdish Society in Iran. We've been hearing about that earlier on. Uh, he's going to answer the central question to this debate, which is why he is our last speaker. Will civil unrest change the face of Iran? Yes or no? Maruf Kabi, what is your conclu conclusion? Thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, important event, and I'm very excited to, to be alongside the other speakers. Uh, I think uh, the other speakers uh, addressed many important points and it seems there is a general agreement uh, on those points. So my answer to this question is uh, it has already changed the face of Iran both domestically and internationally uh, as others uh, mentioned. I say a few words why I think this is the case and then I ask another question which I think is uh, even more important. Domestically, Iran is in another revolution. Why? The current uprising in Iran uh, uh, cannot be merely seen as a continuation of the previous protest movements. Uh, the previous protests were mainly uh, characterized by economic and reformist uh, demands. On the other hand, the current uprising marks the end of the method of persuasion, the dialogue with the regime which proved to be uh, futile anyway. So many uh, previous elements of the regime or reformist Islam Taliban found themselves in exile or in house arrest. Next, the uprising has targeted the entire political order. It is not a reformist one. This is a gradual revolution which started many years ago, I argue, at least uh, after the end of the Green Movement. I don't expect an imminent change but this is a revolutionary phase and will go on. Uh, the nationwide political solidarity is another evidence how the face of Iran has changed. People in Iran now know more about each other. For example, they know more about the Kurdish people and the Kurdish movement. The social composition of this uprising is not limited to the young or women, though they lead that, the uprising, but to all sectors of society. The sheer violence of the uh, violent reaction of the regime uh, continues to prevent uh, many more people to participate in street demonstration, but they continue to support the uprising and advocate uh, its motto. This uprising tells us that the regime has lost its legitimacy, and this point was uh, picked up by uh, an, another speaker who uh, talked about the crisis of legitimacy. We may say the regime didn't have one with many people since its, uh, since its inception, and this is certainly true when we talk about Kurdistan, uh, where, which became a space in the aftermath of the 1979 revolution uh, for all Iranians to continue resisting the Islamic regime. And we may say that the regime has lost its legitimacy with many more people 
for a long time. In any case, the question of legitimacy is a crucial one to explain why we are in a revolutionary phase. The motto of woman life freedom is not just a poetic expression. It says many things about Iran. It, is, it says uh, what is missing and what the Iranians want. Finally, the uprising demands, demands a break with the past and the new generation represents that. This is about how domestically Iran has changed. Globally, I think uh, uh, it is enough to say no small scale movement would have had such a global impact. The fact that we are uh, gathering here today uh, is an indication that we are facing a revolution. It has changed, for example, it has changed despair into hope for the Afghan women who were betrayed. Iran's rivals, such as Saudi Arabia, uh, we, we saw that uh, they denied the news of uprising in favor of the Iranian regime. And this is very interesting because, yes, there is an cr international crisis for the regime, but the question is, will the authoritarian regimes of the region unite against uh, this kind of uprising, which can be an alternative uh, to the uh, problems of the region? No government of the world, I mean those who take public opinion uh, seriously, uh, can, uh, can, can have the same uh, relationship with the Iranian regime, considering uh, with a regime that uh, uh, kills children and uh, has lost its legit legitimacy, and, and a regime that is a threat to peace and democracy regionally and globally. Having said that, I think we need to ask another question, which is uh, as important as this one, uh, or even more important. How should this gradual revolution change Iran? What kind of change will guarantee a new democratic direction for Iran? And this is relevant to the question of democracy. My approach is we need to redefine Iran and make a way for a democratic alternative. This is in contrast to uh, any approach which demands the preservation of the modern structures of Iran. This is, about, this is not about uh, changing the personnel of the regime or bringing a democratic or a republic, a centralized, uh, still a centralized government. This regime has not been a deviation from the path of progress uh, seemingly represented by the Pahlavi order. So this is not about going back not about changing the personnel of the regime, but it, this is about exercising something new. We need new structures which guarantee uh, many things. And I will give several examples only without elaborating on them, but please ask me questions. Uh, we need new structures to guarantee the freedom of and economic prosperity for Kurdistan, Sistan and Baluchistan, Khuzestan, Turkmen, Sahra, Azerbaijan and others in Khurasan and everybody in Iran. The economic structures need to change to prevent having Gurkhabi or sleeping in open graves in Tehran and other major cities. We need to, the new structures uh, should guarantee a more equal gender order, a transformation of gender order in the future of Iran. New structures that guarantee that languages and cultures in Iran enjoy an equal position. We need to elevate other languages and cultures and their literature to the position where the Persian language is at the moment. Of course, without undermining the Persian language, culture and literature, but using them as cultural capital uh, for promoting others. So the new linguistic and cultural structures must challenge the hegemonic position of one against all others. Economic, uh, the new structures uh, should guarantee economic opportunities. In the last two decades, we have witnessed the impoverishment, for example, of the Kurdish working class. Just look at the phenomenon of coal-bearing or border trade in which those who carry goods on their shoulders uh, uh, are the main labor force. And finally, we need a kind of political order which can open the way for us to transform Iran's modern structures. So my answer is how to have a democratic direction is we need to, uh, the aim is to a complete transformation of modern structures of Iran. Of course, this, is, this cannot be achieved overnight. 
This can be achieved during a prolonged cultural process. So we need time and we need to be patient. And this is uh, uh, something which the academics must play a crucial role in. Uh, I think I uh, said what uh, I wanted to say about these two questions and uh, let me stop here and see if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I would like to pick you on one thing before we go around the panel with a couple of questions. Uh, you, you, you talk about the revolution starting many years ago and this 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 sort of progress, slow progress, and then what you would like in place. But given the region and the track record in the region of trying to get change, how long do you think this process would be and how could it be achieved without bloodshed? Um, this is a very important uh, uh, question, but for this, uh, uh, we need, uh, I think, uh, many things. First is uh, solidarity in Iran, and then debate, and going debate on what we want in the future of Iran, what kind of Iran we want, and what we want to change. We need responsibility from all the political actors, the political parties, individual, those who can affect uh, this process. So I think this is not, this much is up to people to prevent bloodshed and uh, more crisis, but uh, people shouldn't be blamed for coming to the street and they shouldn't be scared of uh, by saying that this may lead to uh, bloodshed and uh, turning Iran into another Syria. So this is, uh, I think the, this question and the pressure, the pressure must be put on the regime and their allies, okay, to stop uh, any attempt to uh, to turn this, uh, in many ways, peaceful uprising into into bloodshed. So this is, I, I yeah, because we we heard from from Roy Kashefi uh, how there are the the people sort of seal themselves off, take what they can, don't share it. Uh, so the sort of collaboration and collegiality that you mentioned there is unlikely, isn't it? Uh, uh, you know what, um, I'm a bit optimistic, uh, and uh, very optimistic indeed. I think in the last two decades, uh, one thing we should uh, uh, highlight is the expansion of civil society organization and movements. Okay, and this uh, kind of uh, organization we have uh, witnessed uh, during the last two months and the radical ideas. I think uh, civil society organizations and movements play a crucial role in uh, in these. So in 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 moving that forward. Well, let's let's keep uh, yeah. let's keep that optimism and up. Thank you very much. Uh, stay where you are for the moment because I'd like to go around the panel now on, on two, two two points. Two. Uh, the first one is, is a question from Peter Cornish. We start with Fatima Aman. Uh, would changes in Iran's regime reshape the whole of the Middle East? If so, how? Uh, if you could just answer in a minute or so, that would be great. Fatima Aman, are you with us? Anush Etashami. Yes, I'm here. Ah. Anush, you're, you're here. Um, changes in Iran's regime, how would that reshape the Middle East? A couple of minutes. I think, I think the impact will be dramatic, uh, Humphrey, because Iran has been, if like, the, 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 the block for a, 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 a de-Islamization de de um, of politics, of moving the agenda forward, of enabling other countries like Syria, like Lebanon, like Iraq even, I would I would suggest, and Afghanistan, to move on. It will it will have a dramatic impact. But also, more importantly than that, it'll be the removal of securitized ideology from the landscape that will help other countries to get on with each other and perhaps even to diffuse sectarianism, which has allowed Iran's neighbors to use and abuse against Iran. 
Okay, that's that. That's that is fascinating. I I'm not going to ask you if it can be achieved without bloodshed because we're going to ask that same question to Roy Kashifi. Would changes in Iran's regime reshape the whole of the Middle East? If so, how? Um, I agree with what Anush has just said. Um, I think one of the most important factors is the fear that the region has of a change in Iran because of this very fact um, of separating religion and the religious power which is quite strong within the region from politics and from control over people's lives. Um, I think that bloodshed um, is not in the hands of the people. It's how the governments will approach the protests or the demands, the just demands. Um, I believe people have the right to defend themselves when they are peaceful, they're out on the street with nothing to protect themselves and they're being fired at. So if they defend themselves with throwing rocks or whatever, that's not escalating the bloodshed by the hands of the protesters. So the, the question is not if the people can peacefully demand change, it's how the regimes will respond to this. But crucially, I think the sectarian factor is really important. Iran being Shia and the majority of the region being Sunni, that is a factor that needs to be examined further, and that is the fear. But as I've indicated before, Iran has always been the forefront of change. Iran is the population makeup, the education level, all of that is very different in Iran to the rest of the region. Yeah. And Iran has always led in a sense. So what happens in Iran could threaten the region mm. and it would not be to their advantage to see a major overhaul in Iran. They would probably prefer some kind of reform from within an, an Islamic state still, but a reformed Islamic state, something that's toothless and it's um, behaving and okay, not... That's uh, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, Roxanne Fam Famian, can you uh, could you give us your view on that? Well, I must be the one doomsayer. I mean, it's of course absolutely fantastic to see, you know, women pouring into the streets and and being and having such wonderful slogans and being so brave. But uh, looking at it from a larger picture, I'm I'm very worried about it, this deteriorating into a, a really awful civil war. There's been so many regimes who have made it so clear that they would like regime change. And if our example of what the diaspora outside the country has done during this period, it's dismal. There have been threats, it's been epithets, they've attacked each other. It has been <coughs> a, a very disheartening. And, and how would that uh, reshape the Middle East if, if, if your scenario unfolded? Well, I think a major civil war. I mean, I think Iran is a very different, it wouldn't be another Syria. It is a highly educated, complex country, one of the bigger Middle East countries with an enormous economy. It's an oil country. Already we're seeing arms coming into Khuzestan, the oil area. Many have talked about it in the Middle East of breaking off the South and have it be another country. And so I think it will have huge implications for, I agree with everything that's been said in terms of Iran being always a banner carrier for what might come next, but we don't quite know how that's going to uh, metamorphose into something within the Middle East. Of course, that 79 revolution was one of them. Maruf Kabi, uh, Peter Cornish's question, would changes in Iran's regime reshape the whole of the Middle East? If so, how? I think it depends what kind of, uh alternative uh, uh, Iran will bring to the region. I mean, a democratic, uncentralized government, uh, which is willing to re uh, reform its structures, its ethnic structures, I think that will be uh, an alternative, a promising alternative for the region. Uh, other speakers mentioned, for example, how the Islamic movements uh, panicked uh, about this uh, uh, uprising, the movement, uh, the women's movement. So, and how, you know, we we saw how um, uh, for Afghani uh, women, uh, they became hopeful again. We saw in the same reaction in Turkey, in many other countries. So it depends on the alternative. It depends on the polity and the, uh, uh, the alternative, which is, uh, revolution uh, will bring. It will have a major impact 
maybe we have to ask how how much uh, the Western countries uh, are willing to go with that alternative and with what kind of alternative they will uh, uh, they will uh, they will support. Well, let, let me pick you up pick you up and follow on from that. We'll go backwards around the panel with this second question that's sort of been fed into what we're talking about. What should the West do? And what about this issue of sanctions? Are they a good or a bad thing? Maruf Kabi, well, you can I answer mean, that. And then yeah, we'll go I mean, back uh, yeah, I mean, uh, moral support was mentioned, political, uh, I mean, sanctions, yes, but no economic sanction and certainly, certainly no other <laughs> kind of military intervention. I mean, this is, uh, this is the, so they must be, they must act very responsibly uh, towards uh, this si situation. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, um, I hope, I'm optimistic with um, other non-governmental organizations, you know, human rights organization and many other organizations. I am skeptical of, uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that I'm skeptical of uh, the big powers uh, so they need to act. Uh, uh, they have to be responsible. We we saw what happened in Afghanistan, and uh, the problems. They have been part of uh, those problems. Uh, so I am hoping for their responsible uh, attitudes, uh, actions towards this uh, this situation. Respons responsible, responsible from from, from, from the West. From the West. I, I see yes, that I Fatima see. Amin is back with us. We're going to finish with you. We're going to go back around the panel again. Uh, Roxanne, could you give us your view very briefly on sanctions and what the West should do? Well, I, I agree with Dr. Kabi. I don't think economic sanctions, I've never supported them. I think they hurt the population. And um, I, I think targeted sanctions are much better. Uh, but I think that actually it would be really, I also agree with him, I think having a blanket um, decision not to, to uh, become engaged in Iran and let it work out its own uh, next steps right. would really be the best thing. I think we've seen uh, international, even UN interventions such as into Libya has not gone well. And we need to allow countries to work out their own problems. Okay, that's that's that that's a very good point, uh, Roya Kashifi. Um, uh, what is your view? Western sanctions. Okay, um, two very quick points. One, um, Iran has been under sanctions since 1979. It took hostages right at the beginning, so it's been under one or other form of sanctions since 1979. It's become the the, the ruling elite have become expert at sanction evasion. That's one of the reasons that they have. That we see the corruption, we see embezzlement, we see all the kind of problems that we have. And the fact that that is one huge source of income for a group of elite who are ruling the country. So in effect, sanctions have benefited the ruling elite and has hurt the public. The one sanction that no one has mentioned so far is a self-imposed sanction that the Islamic Republic has imposed on itself by not... Um, signing the FATF and joining the international banking system simply because it would tie its hands with its sanction evasion, the kind of money laundering that it's doing and its funding of terrorism that we've talked about within the region, how it's funding the groups within the region. And that's one of the reasons it's not going to. So it's part of the problem in economic problems in Iran is this kind of self-imposed sanctions that they have. Um, and secondly, um, we carried out um, a survey um, following the Arab Spring and asked Iranians if they were in favor of humanitarian approach, the kind of that we saw in Syria or in Libya or whatever, and what would the public um, opinion would be on that. And overwhelmingly, um, the response that we got out of two and a half thousand people who participated um, was they don't want foreign intervention in Iranian affairs. They want us to be able to resolve it ourselves. So I, I second the fact that we would like to be left to our own device. <laughs> I, I think that that is it. Leave it, leave it, leave it around alone. Uh, Anoush Etishami, could you give us your view, the Western sanctions, uh, in about 30 seconds, please? Uh, absolutely. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, sanctions are a blunt instrument, Humphrey, and, and as such are not effective. If they can't change behavior, they're by definition, they're failing. 
and that is precisely what we've got. I would, on the second point, I would just say that actually Iran and civil society will benefit from hearing from global civil society uh, in terms of solidarity. It's not about Western intervention. It's about social support for Iranians who are struggling for freedom in this context. They want the, the support, not the sanctions, uh, but to be left to their own devices. Fatima Aman, welcome back after your brief absence. Uh, finish for us or wrap up for the panel. Uh, sanctions in the West uh, in, in about 30 seconds, please. Sure. Sorry for missing part of the conversation. I fully agree with all uh, speakers on, you know, in regard to sanctions. There is one way, uh, in my op opinion, to help is that the world, the world should stay connected to the Iranian people, uh, you know, and technical help, which I, I unfortunately, I'm not a, a, you know, expert in how technical help, uh, how technical things work, but uh, that should be, that could be pro uh, provided to Iranian from institutions and firms, you know, involved in communication. Uh, politics should be aside, and uh, direct foreign government's involvement, uh, sh I believe, should be avoided. And it is it is imperative that uh, you know non-government institutions uh, and international or international non-government mm -hmm. institutions stay connected to to the people. But uh, direct foreign government involvement would not be helpful. All right, no foreign government involvement, but the connections and the networking. Thank you so much for that. We are now going to go over to the Democracy uh, Forum chair, Barry Gardner, MP. Uh, he is going to sum up what we've said. And I hope I'm going to, I'm going to ask him, what well, should a British government do when it comes to the Western sanctions? Barry, the screen is yours. Humphrey, uh, thank you. And, and first of all, can I apologize to both Fatima and Anoush that I was, because of parliamentary duties, I had to miss their contributions. I did uh, manage to catch the other three, but my, my sincere apologies. And, and all I can say is if your contributions were anything as enlightening as the three that I did manage to, to listen to, um, then I really have missed a lot. So, um, Thank you to, to all of you. Um, I, in fact, Humphrey, let me begin with, with your question, um, because I, I found this extraordinarily enlightening. Um, the, the way in which there has been unanimity amongst your speakers uh, that actually here, Iran has to develop its own way forward, that sanctions are impeding them finding that way, and in fact are entrenching the power of the regime um, through the whole way in which they can manipulate and, and get around sanction evasion and, and money laundering that entrenches the regime. Um, I found that a, a fascinating counterpoint to everything that I hear in the chamber in the House of Commons, which of course is about how terrible the regime is and how one needs to increase sanctions. Um, so very, very interesting to hear a, a much more on the ground uh, view as to what is required here. Um, now, the, the question, of course, that, that it poses is um, when you're considering um, the, the West's response to the JCPOA, how should we now be progressing that? Should we now be progressing that? Um, because uh, to do so um, would inevitably uh, give greater uh, scope to the regime and not uh, and, and to allow Iran to to develop nuclear capability given all that your your speakers said about the the perverse involvement whether it's in Syria or with Hezbollah and Lebanon Lebanon in, in the in the region um, it, it is 
it is a serious concern for all politicians around the world that we don't see another North Korea develop where you have a, a country isolated with nuclear capacity and indeed in this case uh, not with the the poverty and hunger of of a North Korea uh, but with those oil resources um actually in a much much uh, more powerful position um to dictate terms and the way in which uh, Iran has involved itself not not only in 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 Lebanon not only in Syria but now we see increasingly in Ukraine with the support of the Russian uh, Russian military there so I, I find this a, a real dilemma as a UK politician thinking about these issues. And as I say, it's been, it's been fascinating to, to hear the perspective of, of, of your speakers. If I can uh, maybe uh, look at, at some of the things that I, I would wish to, to, to question, to challenge, uh, Dr. Kabi, um, he was very clear, the unrest has already changed Iran. Um, and it was important, I thought, that he said that this uprising is qualitatively different uh, from previous ones, where, where the, the causes were uh, fundamentally economic. Um, I also found it interesting that he said that the, the people in Iran are now more aware of each of their own disparate groups. Um, and the way in which he said the crisis of legitimacy uh, has now put Iran into a revolutionary phase. Um, again, fascinating to me to find that that Iran's rivals in the region, in Saudi, are, are concerned by the uprising against authoritarian rule. And in that sense, um, are in their media almost appearing to be on the regime side against the people. Um, I, I have to say, I found deeply unconvincing his optimism um, that, yes, he said new structures are required to guarantee freedom of ethnic and gender differentials. Uh, he, he put a huge emphasis on civil society, guaranteeing of economic opportunities, how you know we can we can talk about civil society we can talk about people's assemblies um legislative assemblies but power moves to fill a vacuum um and i cannot see how in in a situation which he called a revolutionary phase there is going to be the space to work out those constitutional arrangements those new civic structures that he talks about um i i'm delighted that he is optimistic but uh, you know i have to say i see no rational basis for that optimism um i with dr farman farman um to recap over what she she said, um, she spoke about sanctions and the rogue state and isolation. Um, is it possible for external influences to play a role? Um, and spoke about the you know who might be the successor um, uh, into the to the supreme leader, and what power base they might have, um, and how the the internal protest. Uh, might change a wider uh, a wider change at the top. Uh, I don't think she or or any any of us would would envisage that this is a Gorbachev situation where somebody has has stayed there at the top, comes into power, and suddenly is going to transform the situation. Um, but I thought her assessment of the the impact on the immediate neighbors the West and, and the relationships with, uh, uh, with Russia and China uh, was, again, a fascinating insight in, 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 into the structural relationships there. Um, and uh, the way she spoke about Lebanon, Hezbollah, and the border agreement, showing the weakness that she believed uh, Iran's leaders are now subject to, uh, not able to object to that uh, border arrangement. I, I want to ask, well, how has that weakness come about? Um, it, 
I assume from what she said later, it didn't come about by sanctions, um, derived from. Um, interesting when she spoke about um, the Revolutionary Guard having everything to lose, and, and actually the, the escape route um, appearing to be only to Syria uh, in, in the event of a collapse of the regime. Um, Islamic neighbors concerned about uh, the power of women and the taking off of the hijab and how that resonates uh, in, in the wider Middle East, but how it resonates in, in Sunni countries just as much as Shia. Um, and I thought it was, again, really interesting, the, 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 the point that she made about um, the focus that the West now has on human rights rather than simple security concerns and economic concerns in relation um, uh, to Iran. And uh, how, how difficult that makes it uh, for the, the leaders in the West to get round the table and to sit down and negotiate, uh, once again, the JCPOA. Um, uh, again, inevitable, I suppose, that, that the influence of China, uh, the the way in which AI, software recognition, uh, that whole apparatus of state control uh, being brought to bear uh, and defining uh, in many ways the, the, the relationship that, that Iran uh, has emerging with China. Um, Roya Kashefi spoke of, of women as the vanguard um, and spoke about the intertwining of Islamic and civil law. And again, th th this has been pure education for me, I have to say. Um, I, I'm not a, a, a Middle East specialist. I'm not a, a, an Iranian uh, specialist, but I'm a follower of these events. But but really to, to get to, gr I'd love to hear more from her about the way in which it is possible, or if it is possible, to disentangle a challenge to the civil law without actually also um, it being a challenge to, to the Islamic law. Um, and, and how precisely um, one can see a, a transition where the fundamentals of the of the Shia religion are maintained in place, whilst civil society transforms to uh, a freer, uh, more, uh, where, where human rights are guaranteed um, uh, future. So yeah, uh, absolutely fascinating. I've, I've learned a great deal. I will have to think a great deal more about what has been said. Uh, and of course, what I do want to do, and, and once again, my apologies, uh, I, I will need to go back and, and revisit the first two speakers so I get a more comprehensive view of exactly uh, what our discussion has entailed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. But before I let you go, you raised a conundrum that if you could give me a very short answer to uh, the views you heard here about non-interference and sanctions against the views you hear in the chamber uh, and every Western politician, whether it's in the House of Commons or in Congress or the Senate, is going to be faced with the same conundrum. How do you actually get the views here through the democratic political system? Politicians in the UK feel they have to do something or say something. And I think that's the same throughout the world. Um, you see a, an appalling situation uh, as uh, has arisen from September 16th with Masamini and, 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 and the, the way in which there is this total unrest. And politicians don't like ever to be in a position where it appears that they can do nothing. And therefore, they need to be able to say something. And I, I suspect it is very easy to say, because this is wrong, we need to tighten the sanctions and hurt the regime more. 
what you have, I think, very persuasively argued uh, this afternoon is that actually the sanctions do not hurt the regime. They have been, in, to some extent, a facilitator of the regime. They have entrenched the regime's capacity for control over their own people. And, and that is something, I'm afraid, which will be a very hard message for most politicians to take in the West, to take on board, because it's a do-nothing option. Um, it's a, it's a hands-off option. And as I say, politicians really dislike appearing to their own constituents to be powerless. Barry, thank you for that. It's an honest answer. We'll, we'll look to see what you do when the issue comes up and how you vote. And if you make it to 10 Downing Street or Foreign Secretary, uh, what you do after that. But thank you so much. For that. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Time's wing chariot is upon us. Now, we've really plowed, as Barry said, into some fascinating and insightful ground today. Thank you for Tima Amen, Anoush Etashami. Roya Kashif, Roxanne, Farman Farmian, and Maruf Kabi. Uh, thank you, Barry Gardner. Thank you, Lord Charles Bruce, and for all the thoughts of you, the audience, uh, dealing uh, with this issue. Our next Democracy Forum debate is December the 7th, when we're going to be talking about, I have, and I haven't even got the topic here, but I we will get it to you, I'm sure. Uh, tune in then. Please buy and look at our sister publication, Asian Affairs, which delves deeply into the issues and angles that are so often missed. This is it, Asian Affairs. And until December the 7th, stay involved, keep challenging, keep democratic debate alive. From me, Humphrey Hawksley, and all at the Democracy Forum, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.